Hello, and thank you for joining us for this week's Ask Joe webinar, where we will cover the Kogo and inverse functions of Survey Pro. You'll learn the uh, multitude of functions available and the various input options for these functions as well. Uh, you'll find that Survey Pro actually has a very logical system, and, and uh, if you understand how to do one function, really, you can do just about anything in there. So presenting today is Joe Sass. After the presentation, please ask Joe your questions about anything with uh, regard to Survey Pro Kogo or the inverse routines. A little background on Joe. Joe is the uh, Channel Development Manager for Spectra Geospatial. And as a field application engineer, he is the liaison between product marketing, sales, and engineering. He has a degree in geography that blends nicely with his passion for surveying, and since 1988 has been active with the California Land Surveyors Association. In 2004, he began representing us within the RTCM Standards Organization, and he currently sits on the Board of Directors. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Sass. Thank you very much, Mr. Binder, Joe Binder, uh, both Joes. So you can ask either Joe anything. Uh, Joe Binder knows all. So Joe, did you say since 1988 I've been with the CLSA? It's 98, I think. Uh, 1998. Okay. Did I say 88? I, I, I don't know. It sounded like it. Doesn't matter. Uh, I'm old, not, not quite that old yet. So, Survey Pro Kogo. Um, I don't know. Where am I going? I'm unable to advance the slide. So, I don't know if any of you guys remember this. Um, this is going back. This was my launch into the uh, into the world of land surveying. Let me turn off my web cam for a minute. There we go. Don't want you to be distracted. So this is uh, the HP 48 calculator, Hewlett Packard calculator. I was I wanted to claim that they were the ones that invented the word Kogo, but apparently Kogo goes back even further than this photograph depicts. Um, it was actually a term that was coded by MIT. In the early, early days of computers, every bit and byte counted. And so instead of saying coordinate geometry, the, the propellers uh, there at MIT decided to call it COGO as a short nomenclature for coordinate geometry. And early on, um, tripod data systems, which you're looking at there, is, is actually the, the same company that is that wrote Survey Pro originally, and that's what we're here today to talk about. And what you're looking at is not the original platform for Survey Pro. I think Survey Pro originally uh, came out on an HP 41 calculator. However, it was supplanted by this HP 48 GX calculator, with, which you see here. Very interesting about this calculator. Um, it was a graphing calculator. It, it could really put things in a display format that was not uh, common in that day. It used a, a notation, a reverse Polish notation. You'll, you'll not see an equal sign on that uh, keyboard. And uh, Tripod Data Systems actually was formed from a group of, group of engineers that left Hewlett Packard uh, and, and bought the, the core algorithms of Hewlett Packard as far as it related to surveying. And they created Tripod Data Systems and uh, eventually Survey Pro. And it ran on this platform using these cards that you see in the back. Um, this uh, calculator was unique when it was discontinued somewhere, I'm guessing 1992, uh, I'm sorry, um, around the year 2000 was probably discontinued. It went from being $150 brand new to being about $400 used because people uh, relied on this. This was one of the best menu driven survey interfaces in the world at that time. And in my, in my mind, it continues to be one of the best. So let's talk about uh, the coordinate geometry, uh, bearing, azimuth, intersection. I've got a lot of slides, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each slide. Uh, really, I want to, as Joe Binder alluded to, I want to talk about the logic of Survey Pro and how it works. And we can start right here. So in this bigger picture, You've got the, the intersection routine, and you've got three tabs on the, on the right, input, results, and map. And right now we're on the map page that is showing you the results of whatever intersection 
uh, routine we calculated. And it looks like what we calculated was the intersection between some radius between PT9X and PT40. So you've got a nice graphical display there. On the, on the left, I'm, I'm sorry, on the right there, uh, you've got that pop-out screen. And I, I wanna talk about point, location, and line. So a point is a point. So in this uh, intersection uh, display on the left, PT40 is a point. So if I click on it, I'm going to get options related to a point. And in this case, I did click on a point because I've got point options. So I can inverse point to point, I can inverse point to location and point to line. I think point to point and point to line are fairly obvious. Uh, but point to location really, in this example, refers to all of that white space out there. So let's say I had some type of a background map that was not anything uh, line related. Uh, I might want to click on two building corners, for instance, to understand how much street uh, facing they take up. So that's the general logic. Um, we'll talk about corner angle and line to location. Again, location is any, anywhere in white. Uh, in this example, line is any line feature like you can see in the AutoCAD drawing below. And then point to point is, is the regular inverse that we're all familiar with. So point to point, this is um, Survey Pro breaks out inverse, uh, particularly from the rest of the Kogo routines. There are a lot of Kogo routines, you'll see them ad nauseum today. Um, but we've broken out the inverse because that seems to be the one that speaks to most surveyors most often. Uh, any of these routines can be inserted into the quick pick, which is this gold star you see on the, on the lower right. Um, and then they can allow for quick access. Point to point is a popular one to have on the quick pick menu. So here, you know, I can just type in point numbers. Um, that's one of my options. That's a manual entry. I can select points from the map. You can see that the map is telling me select two points. I've clicked on PT2X, and then I would select another one, and that would be my two points to inverse between. I can drop down the list, uh, that, that power drop down there on the right-hand side of the, the menu uh, that has the point number, and I can choose the points from a list. I can create them, uh, choose them from the map. I can even uh, create new points at this, at this list uh, through this dialog. When I've done the solution, I get a results page. And you can see again on the far right, we're on the results page. And I've got the results of my inverse between PT2X and PT3X um, azimuth, which is a bearing. Some people, some people prefer to work in bearings, which actually breaks the compass up into quadrants. So you can see that we're in the northwest quadrant. Um, and you can see how that relates to an azimuth with slope distance, vertical distance. Um, horizontal distance, et cetera. Looks like we're nearly on our backside line or something like that since the delta north is, is a mere 23 centimeters. If I wanted to visualize this, I could click on the map tab on the far right, and that would then show me visually what the solution looks like. We also have this inverse choice from the map screen, and I put the map in capitals. Uh, just to emphasize that this is the map screen. We have other pages like in the Traverse side shots and Kogo routines that have map as part of the solution set, part of the results set. Uh, but when I say map, this is an active map dialog from which I can survey and from which I can do a variety of coordinate geometry calculations. So here in the map screen, I've clicked on a point. How do I know I've clicked on a point? because my options are point related, point to point, point to location, point to line. I would not be able to, um, I would not have those choices if I had clicked in some of the white spots that you see that are not points in this, uh, in this screen capture. Corner angle would allow me to click on two more points and then calculate the corner angle created by those three points. Notice also I have the ability to stake to a point. So if I'm connected to a total station, or connected to a GNSS receiver, I can click on that point and instantly stake to it, which is outside the, the discussion today, but just as a side note. 
So I've selected a point. I said select point to point. The map screen is telling me to select a second point to inverse to. Once I've done that, the results are displayed and uh, as far as graphically and uh, numerically, they're in gray. I can inverse point to line. The line can be defined by two points. And then the resulting, you see that I have the option once I've solved uh, this position, I can store it as a solution or as a point in my point file. If this text were important to me, the, the results of this inverse point to line, I could right mouse click, which is an extended keystroke on this page, and I would be able to save this page as a text file. This is uh, the map display that shows what I've just done. I picked a line, I picked a point, um, and I've got the perpendicular distance uh, to that point on that line and we've called that point PTL01, point to line. Here you can see it on the map page. We've got the same choices, point to line. Um, and I've got that choice because I clicked on a point. I can click on a line or I can click on two points to create a line. Survey Pro is very logical in the way it allows you to uh, make your selections, and it tries to help you with helpful hints throughout the process. So here you can see I've clicked on two lines, uh, $DXF4, $DXF5. Uh, that's my line, and I've inversed from $DXF. When you see inside Survey Pro map page, when you see a point that has a dollar sign, like you see here, those are temporary points. They will not be saved to the point file unless you want them to be saved to the point file. If you right mouse click on DXF4, for instance, you would say uh, you would see the option to save the point and then it would be inserted into the um, point file. Otherwise, when you leave this page, those dollar DXF or dollar whatever um, um, points will disappear. Just to clarify, when you're on a data collector, a right mouse click is simply a tap and hold and it will yes. bring up those options. Thank you, Joe. So here we have under the inverse, we have the point polyline routine. Okay, I can choose an existing polyline if one is already defined, or I can make a create a polyline uh, just by uh, tapping on a sequence of points. I think that's what was done here. It's not a smooth line. There are no arcs. It's just connecting the dots. Right? I'm able to tell the Survey Pro where I want to stake. Um, I'm sorry, inverse point to, uh, what station I want to inverse to, I guess is what that is telling me. I want to inverse to station zero plus 10, which would be 10 units down the, down the line. And there's my result. And there it is on the map page. Other choices for polyline, I can choose them from the list. As I mentioned, I can tap the points. I can create an alignment, um, or I can even choose an alignment. Survey Pro differentiates polylines from alignments. Alignments are, are defined uh, by station and by uh, segment. So I have straight segments, I have spiral segments, and I have arcs. Whereas polylines are usually just a, a sequence of points that are connecting the dots. Also notice that I have the ability to reverse the line. I can inverse to multiple points, so I don't have to do it as a single um, as a single uh, action. Right here, I've selected eight points from the map page. I could have done it from the list as well. I could have specified a range. I could see the two from there. I could have put in something like one dash eight, and it would have selected points one through eight. If that's the way they were numbered. Um, regardless of how I selected them, I've got eight points that I want to inverse to from point number PT12. 
And you can't see it on this page, but maybe by the scroll bar there on the right, you can see that the list of all of the points that I, all eight points that I inverse to are listed sequentially uh, on the results page. Right here, I'm just showing you PT12 to PT30, uh, but if you were to scroll up or scroll down, you'd see the rest of the results. And the results page or the map page uh, graphically presents the solutions that it has just provided. Location to point, so again, anywhere in the white areas of the map page to a specific point, I can do an inverse to. Here I'm choosing a temporary point, and then I've got a northing and an easting as a location that I want to, to solve, and then I want that solution to be stored into the point file as PTL100. So here I've, I've, I've clicked on some area in white. So not a point, not a line. And I'm now given the option to inverse to a, a point in the, in the drawing, a, a, another location in the drawing, or a line in the drawing. I can also stake to that location. So let's say I had a background image that had buildings and I wanted to stake to the corner of the building. I could actually stake to that. It's not an AutoCAD line. It's not a real feature. It's just a background image. Um, and yet I would be able to stake to that location which has no point or line definition. So those were the inverse routines of Survey Pro, and I broke them out uh, from the rest of the Kogo. And here you see the rest of the Kogo. I've got two pages, right? So I'm on page one, and I've got a second page with additional Kogo features. In I would say that probably the first six choices, point and direction, intersection, offset, offset point, station offset, corner angle, those are the ones that everybody is using. The rest of them, probably not so much. So when we get to that section of this presentation, I will probably not spend any time on the slides and let the slide do its own speaking uh, while I take a drink of water. So point and direction, uh, again, this is a popular one to add to that gold star. And this, in this screen capture, you can see that the gold star is at the top. So sometimes the quick pick uh, is on the side, sometimes it's on the top, and sometimes it looks slightly different, but it's still a gold star. Um, and here I'm going from point PT9X, an azimuth of zero at a horizontal distance of 100. I'm given the choice to store the point or not. Notice here, I've got some kind of strange azimuth here. That azimuth might have been defined by doing something like 6-7. If I had a 0.6 and a 0.7 in the file, and uh, if I wanted to use that same azimuth as between those two points, I could use that nomenclature and it might show up in the, um, in the field then like this. You notice also under that drop-down list, I have a calculator. So if I want to get into that HP 48 style calculator, and be able to do some calculations to figure out this azimuth. Uh, there's also a use button inside the calculator. So once I've done my calculation, I hit use, and it will populate this field and bring you back to this page with the answer that you calculated there. My results page. And then the map page and what it looked like. Intersections, here we're using a distance, um, and this is a radius, right? So the radius intersection of these two points, and do I want to store those? And each, we know that when we find an intersection, we'll have two solutions, and so do I want to store intersection one or intersection two or both or none? So that's kind of the logic here that Survey Pro is offering. intersection one, intersection two, and do I want to store them? Then these are the radiuses, radii of the two PT points you see right and left of these arcs. You could have a distance against an azimuth or bearing, as I show in this example. 
In this example, I do not want to store the result, but it shows me the answer. I can do azimuth bearing, azimuth bearing type intersections. So here you see that the intersection of those two bearings or those two azimuths uh, produce that intersection I dash SECT space one. And I have the choice to store that in the point file or not. Offset line, uh, offset line and offset points are very useful. Here I've chosen a line. I want to be offset from that line by 75, in this case, centimeters to the left of the line. And I want to save it as an alignment in my job file. I don't have to, but I, in this case, you can see that's my selection. And here you can see the line that has been created at the offset. Uh, this, in this example, I just did the same thing, but I offset it to the right, and I can save that as well um, as a polyline in my job for future staking or uh, layout purposes. Offset points. So here I'm showing you um, a way to select points. You can just manually type them in and delimit them with commas. Uh, you could also use a dash and, and use point ranges as it shows. And Survey Pro tries to help you uh, by giving you examples of the syntax that is expected uh, in this dialogue with all of those examples below. Here I want to store points. I want to store the nodes, which would be non-stationed points, but at some angle um, change. And then a station interval is specified there, and then what I want them to be coded as. So once I've solved that, you can see that I've got the offset points created at a station from the angle points. Uh, I'm sorry, from the line that I specified, as well as the nodes which you can see there that was created at the angle point, which was off station. You can create offset points from a DXF line. So in this case, I've got a line, an arc that has no verticality, so to speak. I think it's a flat drawing. And I'm asking the program to create um, points at a station interval of five meters, and I want them to be coded as OS underscore L4. And there we go. Very quick and easy way to take your AutoCAD drawing and give you something to stake from that's meaningful. Station offset. This is where I start going faster and faster because I have a lot of slides that are not very interesting, but I want to at least make sure you guys are aware of them and what they briefly do. Station and offset. So I've picked a line and I've, I, I've said zero station. I want to go zero station and I want to be offset by 5.012, you can see. So this is showing me on that, on that line, that, that line that's going down and to the left, that's my station. Uh, You can also then create points. You see that we've got dollar sign LE1 and dollar sign LE2. Those are temporary points in the file. Um, and if I want to create them permanently, I can right mouse click on them and save them to the point file. Station and offset again. Reverse the line. You can see the line that's highlighted there. Start station. At station, I want an offset of two meters to the to the right, and I want you to store that point as 801. And there you go. Corner angle, I mentioned it briefly earlier. This is the resulting angles from connecting three points. Um, Survey Pro provides you with both an internal angle and external angle. The drop down here. Uh, on the right-hand side next to uh, PT6X, for instance, that drop-down menu will allow you to go 
again, with the same Survey Pro logic, you can pick it from a map, you can create a new point, you can pick it from a point list. You can manually type it in, as I may have done here, or on the on the right hand side, uh, left hand side of that field, you see the map image. I can actually select the uh, point from the map page. So multiple ways to select that point or to select the three points. Here you can see I've got two solutions, angle left and angle right should add up to 360 degrees. Um, and you can see the other information about um, the solution of that corner angle. Corner angle from the uh, map page is also available. Same routine, just slightly different dialogue, but it ends up with the same answer. Gives you hints along the way. You've selected one point, now you got to select a second point, and you got to select an end point, and then it gives you the answer. Compute area, not, not typically something we have to do very often in the land survey world, but we do have a couple of different ways um, to do this. So we choose a boundary for the area. Here we can you can see you can tap points, you can choose polylines that all might, might or might not be closed and close them. You can choose an alignment. Um, so you see that you have various options to, to choose the boundary that you're going to compute the area for. In this example, I've clicked through five points and I wanna uh, compute the boundary or compute the area there. I hit solve and there are my answers. With length and perimeter, you can tell because length and perimeter are the same. Uh, it's a flat drawing. There is no elevation involved here. <laughs> Again, if I wanted to save this result, I would simply right mouse click on uh, this page and it would allow me to save this as a text file in the Survey Pro Jobs directory. Surface area is a bit different from Compute area, compute area is a 2D computation where a surface area will actually take into account contours. Uh, I can also put a thickness parameter here so that I can actually compute volume. So here you can see it's computed a surface area as well as a volume. Triangle solutions. So. Going back to high school trigonometry, I'm sure this looks familiar to most of us. Uh, we've got all the triangle solutions you could ever imagine or want. Again, notice that the calculator is a choice here um, so that you can um, do calculations to figure out any of these parameters. AU conversion allows me to take imperial units such as inches and convert them into decimal feet. Soon to be decimal international feet. Right? That's a different discussion. Here's my solution page uh, from that triangle, and I can save those results if I need. This is where I um, start showing more and talking less, because really, we do everything. I, I haven't had a, a COGO request in a long time that we don't already do. And so we have lots of different ways to compute triangles. We have lots of different ways uh, to do a lot of things. So here, here's the map check routine, where we can check to make sure that we get closure. Right? That's basically what a map check does, is it goes around the perimeter of a property and make sure that when you get back to the beginning, it closes on itself. And that's what the map check routine does inside Survey Pro. Got some kind of a distance error of three and a half centimeters. Is that acceptable? It was probably introduced for the sake of this uh, demonstration. Shows me my precision levels is one in 113,000 good enough. Um, and I can save this again if, if I need to. Make decisions based on this page. Here we come to page two of the Kogo routines. And you can see, again, we go on and on. Some of them you've seen already or you've heard about like the AU conversion. Um, subdivide area and subdivide lot are, are interesting routines. Um, you see that there are two methods for subdividing an area. There's the hinge method and a parallel method. 
And they both are quite different and useful in different ways. So in this example, I'm choosing the hinge method of, of subdividing an area. I've got my, um, my solution here. And I've got the graphical representation of the solution here as well. So that's the hinge method. I've defined this angle uh, is defined by point number three. So an angle somewhere around uh, what, 95 degrees. And then a, a, an amount of acreage or a, an amount of square meters. And that is where the intersection comes to meet those parameters as outlined here. I said, I want 400,000 square meters, 40 hectares. And that's what it comes up with. Here on the parallel method, I'm going to choose two points, and then I'm going to extend a line that's parallel to those two points that meets the parameters of what I want. In this case, again, I want 400,000 square meters. You can see that parameter at the top left. Uh, I want the line to be defined as points one and two. And then I've got the the azimuths coming off of points one and two that I want that to be based on to create my parallel segment, right? So you can see that the azimuth departure from point one is a little bit shy of east, and the azimuth coming from point two is just a bit more than due east. Okay, so there's the answer, and there's the graphic. Subdivide lot, very similar. Select a line. Open polygon, so here I have not closed the polygon, but uh, it will close it automatically for me. And then what do I want? Do I want the, the subdivision to happen as a percentage of this polygon? Do I want it to be broken down into hectares or acres or square feet or square yards or square meters? So I'm given my choices as far as how I want to select uh, the subdivision. There's my answer. I guess I did not show the, the graphical on that. So horizontal distance, vertical distance to slope distance and zenith angle. That's pretty self-explanatory. There's my answer, with and without. So you can see this is without CNR, and this is with CNR. So there is a slight difference there, even at 100 meters. Slope distance, zenith angle to horizontal distance, vertical distance. Again, same thing as the one above, but in, in reverse. AU conversions, here you can see the, the choices that you have. International feet, I guess I'm working in, or US feet. Um, taking meters here and converting it to international feet. And I get to choose the decimation of the inch. I think we go out to 64th of an inch, for those of you that are familiar with reading that, that syntax. Average points, I don't know really why you would want to do this. Maybe you've taken a bunch of observations on the same point. And you want to find the mean of those points. I've selected a very silly example, but it points it out. I've chosen four points. I can use the elevation or not. And then I get my results page. Seems like I should have seen results. Here are my results with the residual showing up. Uh, we have curved solutions. So these are also part of the coordinate geometry solutions of Survey Pro. And there are two pages of curved solutions. And we, we don't have time, nor do I have the energy, nor do I think you guys have the patience to go through all of them. I have outlined them in this presentation. And this presentation will be available on the dealer training portal of Spectra Geospatial, as well as on our YouTube channel as a webinar. 
Um, so you can come back and look at this later if you want, but there are curve solutions uh, galore, I guess I will say, and I'll just briefly step you through them. Uh, so here, I've, I've instead of going through the actual pages, I've gone through most of the ways that you can define curves. And to define the curve, you have to have two pieces of knowledge. And I've outlined the various combinations of knowledge that you must have about that curve uh, in order to define it. Okay. Aren't you glad I did that and didn't go through all the pages of example? Uh, but I do, not all of them. So radius and delta, radius and length, radius and chord, radius and tangent. Do I need to read them for you? Can I just step through these? Radius external, mid-ordinate, degrees of arc with a delta, degrees of arc with a length, degrees of arc and chord, degrees of arc and tangency, degrees of arc with an external solution, the mid-ordinate, degrees of chord, length, delta, chord, tangent, external, mid-ordinate. Any curve that you define can be staked out. Right? So you can immediately go and stake it. It doesn't matter if you're using GPS or total station. You can go and stake it out once you've defined it. PI, points of intersection and tangents. All of that, by the way, was under that menu right above, curve solution, all of those. So here, again, we've got lots of choices, point of intersection, point of curvature, point of tangency, radius. We want to store these points or not. Here you can see we've, we've decided to store the points, so it calculated it and stored them. Three-point curve solutions. Point of curvature or radius point. Those are the three, uh, the, the two different choices there up on top. If you're ever curious about the abbreviations, uh, you can hit the question mark that you see up in the upper power bar uh, next to the gold star. If you hit that question mark, it will take you into a help menu uh, regardless of if you're on a Ranger 3 or a PC uh, Windows 10 platform, uh, it will take you to the help menu and it will describe this page for you. Again, always when you do the computations, the solutions are available graphically or textually uh, or both. Always. Input, results, and map. Always there, toggle between those three. If you want to do a new calculation, just hit the input tab and you're back to the input and you're, you're able to select a new set of points. Radius points, again, same basic types of choices that you would expect um, there. You also have choices including delta, degrees of arc, degree of chords, and tangent length, uh, in addition to the radius choice you see there. Tangent to circles, tangent line. I think this one is better described by result. So you're basically finding the tangent line between two circles. Who, I mean, I can't imagine when I would ever need that. I'm sure that someone asked for this at some point in history and we implemented it, but I have never seen a use case for this. I'd uh, be interested in the chat window to see if anybody has a comment about that. Curve layout. Point of curvature, deflection, point of intersection, deflection, tangent offset, chord offset. Traverse on curve. Parabolic curve. Long ago, I decided that I would not read slides to people, and I uh, am pretty good with that. I'm confident you all can read this, and I will just allow you time to read it. Parabolic layout. I don't think that happens a lot anymore. I think we stake lines that are generated from AutoCAD, and if it happens to be a parabola or a spline 
or an arc or a straight segment. I think that's what we do. I don't think that anybody is actually going out there and defining parabolas in the field. You might be wrong about that, but we have these, uh, these features of the software that have been in there for 25 years, and there's no reason to deprecate them since we've already written the code to make it happen, right? So that's why they're there. And I would say it's one of the richest coordinate geometry uh, library tools in our industry yet today. Straight grade. That one's easy to understand. I understand why people might want this one. And again, maybe if straight grade is something that I'm very interested in doing, I can take that, I can click on that, that uh, gold star you see up to, off to the right. I can go down to the bottom of the list. I can say edit quick pick and I can add straight grade to that list. And now anytime I wanna get into straight grade, I click on the gold star and I don't have to navigate to this particular page on the curve menu part of COVID. Spirals, this is page two of the curve menus. Right, so we've got spiral, spiral layout, and traverse on spirals. Again, I'm not sure how many people are doing traverse on spiral. Um, it's the bottom of page two, so I'm, my guess is not a lot. Um, just a note, I'm in the map, notice capital M, capital A, capital P screen. Uh, so I'm in, in the map page and I've hit that black uh, triangle that pops out my snaps. And there are seven snaps that you can choose from and I, I include them in the coordinate geometry because in a way they are calculating coordinate geometry. We've given you iconology that attempts to describe what the snaps do for you, uh, but I'll just walk through them quickly, right? So here I can just snap to the closest point around, right? So it'll identify which is the closest point and snap to it. This one will snap to the midpoint of any line. So if I click on any of those straight segments or any of those arcs, it will find the center point of that line. Snap to the end of a line, snap to an intersection of two lines. Snap to point of intersection. Um, You take an arc and you find the, the point of tangency from both ends, and that point will be created out there. Again, I think the icon does a good job of describing what that does. And then in an inverse kind of way, this will uh, snap to and create a radius point. And whenever I create these points or make a snap that creates these points, for instance, I snap on this icon, then I snap on an arc, it will create my radius point. That radius point will have a dollar RP something or other afterwards. And if I want to save that as a permanent point to my file, I simply right mouse click on it and I say create point. It pulls in the northing and the easting and if applicable, the, the height, you can code it, you can describe it and you can save it to the job file. This is a snap to a point anywhere on the closest arc or line. And then this is my erase button. Uh, again, I can use this to erase all of my temporary points. Those are all the points that have dollar signs, or I can simply exit this page and come right back in and all of my temporary points will be gone. So with that being said, you have been a very patient audience. You made it through 155 slides, believe it or not. I hope it wasn't too painful. And at this point, if there are any questions, I would welcome them. I hope I haven't been talking to an empty audience. Oh, sorry, I was on uh, mute there. Apologize. Uh, thank you, Joe. There, there are no questions at the moment, but uh, I think it's fair to summarize that uh, if we fill in the blanks and hit the solve key in Survey Pro, that uh, if you can remember those steps, you're, you're pretty much good to go in any routine in Survey Pro. Uh, the question mark that Joe had mentioned, that is the manual that is always accessible for you. So uh, not just in coordinate geometry, but on any of the routines. And if you'd like to use this, whether in the field or in the office, uh, for the coordinate geometry routines themselves, and you don't have a copy of Survey Pro, you can download it from our website at spectrogeospatial.com. 
And this program will run for you in a demonstration mode where it's actually fully capable of all the coordinate geometry routines. It just is limited on how many points you can actually save in the job. So great for uh, any office calculations that you may want to do. So again, want to thank you for joining us today and have a great week. And we look forward to seeing you at next week's Ask Joe seminar. Bye-bye. Nice to see everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.